For the most part, I've been making bowls that have more or less the same rim for almost a decade now. They come to a simple conclusion in a rounded lip that's sometimes a bit sharper so it breaks through the glaze slightly and other times the curve is softer. Anyway, if you've been following along recently, you may have seen a video where I threw and trimmed some bowls that were far more angular in their appearance, made in an attempt to make the bowls I usually produce fit slightly more coherently with the rest of my body of work. And after firing a handful of them, which I really liked, I can call that idea a success. I'll leave a link to that video down in the description below. So that brings me to this video, which in a way shows the creation of some more test pieces. This time it's focused on the rim of the pot, which I'm going to split and make a step on. An additional groove that travels around the circumference of the bowl, which isn't a new feature. You can find the same motif on some of my teapots, jars and mugs. And so I thought, why not try it on a bowl? And that's exactly what this video shows. The creation of these pieces from a lump of soft clay to the finished fired objects. At this point, I've centered the lump of clay. It's been opened up with enough clay left in the base so that I can turn a tall foot ring from the excess. I've then pinched and pulled up much of the weight in the lower portions of the wall. And now I'm beginning to pull it out to create a more curvaceous form. Yet, as I want to alter the rim of this pot, I leave it relatively bulky so there's enough clay in this section to actually work with. If at this point the rim was razor sharp and came to a fine point, there's no way I could throw in the step detail I want. Now the rough shape of the bowl has been made. I'll sponge out the excess water before using a sharp curved kidney to scrape the inside surface clean, leaving a lovely smooth interior. Following this, I'll clean up the underside of the pot, scraping away much of this slippy clay from around the base and also running a sharp edge over the outside curve, which makes for just a drier, more sturdy surface. And now for the rim, I squeeze just a tiny bit of slip over it and then using my index finger, I divide the rim into two sections, a horizontal plane and a sharp upward facing lip. And the idea is, having a right angle around the top like this will create an area the glaze can pull into whereupon it will deepen in colour and intensify nicely whilst at the same moment the glaze should break quite dramatically on the sharp inner lip and the outer ledge too. By this point after making thousands of pots with the same glazes I typically know how they'll react over certain finishes but in some cases you really just need to see it in the flesh before committing to creating larger batches of work with this feature. And although basically finished, I wasn't quite happy with the form, so by using that same sharp metal kidney, I just ease the walls out a little bit more, creating a more shallow shape. And in some ways, this is the easiest point at which to do this kind of work, as I've scraped away most of the slip off this vessel now, leaving generally quite dry surfaces overall, which means the form holds its shape that much better, as I force the overhanging walls out the wire is then slid underneath it and then I really press my fingers into that excess clay around the bottom and I spin the wheel at the exact same moment I lift. There's a knack to lifting pots off like this and it really helps using a clay body that contains a bit of grog as it won't stick to your hands quite so much. I'll now leave this bowl out overnight so much of the moisture left in the clay evaporates which causes the pot to dry out but I don't want to let it dry all the way out otherwise it'll be impossible to trim it and refine the shape, be it the foot, the walls, or the rim in this instance. I decided to trim the rim section last, as if I made it nice and crisp initially, and then upturned it on its rim, there's a chance I've damaged that section, as it's pushed against the metal wheel head. But I did want to trim all the way down to the rim at this stage, so I placed a spinner tool on top, through which I can push down really quite hard, which pins the pot in place, preventing it from skidding around on the rotating wheel. Now, I do it this way because if I was trimming conventionally, I would have secured the pot down with three lumps of soft clay that have pushed around the rim, which means there's no way I can trim that far down. But this works surprisingly well, and once I was happy with the curve and the thickness of the wall towards the rim section, I could then secure it in place with three lumps of soft stoneware clay, 
and as this is quite a low, wide piece, I don't need the spinner at all when trimming the underside. In the same way I might need it when trimming pots that are quite tall and have a tendency to topple over to one side. I can now use my sharp tungsten carbide turning tools to really refine the underside of the pot, the foot ring especially. You can see that the clay is a little bit on the dry side, as when the clay is shaved away it sometimes comes off in small fragments. And it's entirely my fault, I shouldn't leave pots out exposed to the open air when I leave my electric kiln firing overnight. You can see it's worse towards the rim, and then as I work my way up the form, the stoneware gets gradually damper and the clay comes off in nicer ribbons. With the walls done, I can turn my focus onto the foot. I begin by trimming two distinct facets, which is pretty much how I finish the bases of all my bowls. The plane that meets the curve of the wall creates a groove into which my glazes will pull as they flow down the curved exterior shape of the bowl, making something called a glaze catch. And without one, say if the foot ring just reversed completely vertically, I'd probably have more pots fused to the kiln shelves during the firing, as there's nothing really in the way to prevent it from cascading down. Once everything looks neat, the spinner can be removed and I can begin hollowing out the foot. I typically begin by just trimming this surface flat, after which I can begin the task of removing all the excess mass left in this foot, purposefully left, I should add, as I like making bowls that have a relatively tall foot. And there are two ways of doing this, really. You can either do what I've done, which is throw the bowl initially with enough clay left in the base to turn a foot from. Or you can throw simply the curved wall section of the bowl, wait for it to go leather hard, trim it, and then attach a coil of soft clay and throw that into the foot. It's a useful method, but not for feet only this tall, as it's so much easier just to leave that tiny bit of weight in the base to trim it from. And it's much more unlikely for anything to go wrong, as you aren't joining two parts together, which if you are doing, you then have to contend with the parts potentially cracking around the join as they dry unevenly or you're trying to join two pieces of clay that are much different in thickness. It's more useful when making vessels that stand on much taller feet, but they're more akin to pedestals at that point. And if you're throwing the feet of bowls that are only as tall as mine in this video, then I think it's probably the case of making the process more complicated than needs be. This was a slower process than usual, simply as the clay really was quite firm. But once I was happy with the foot, the shape defined, and everything neat and tidy. I finally stamp in my maker's mark onto this top facet that will ultimately become the lowest portion of the bowl and it's the only section of the bowl that will remain unglazed so my maker's mark will be visible even if it is quite small. With the underside done I can get started on the rim which is the part I've been waiting to trim this entire time. I begin by making sure the wheel head is clean before carefully placing down my carefully finished bowl I then lightly tap centred it, and to keep this held in place, as I didn't want to ruin my carefully finished foot by pressing lots of soft clay against it, I instead do all this trimming just by keeping the pot pinned down once again with my trusty spinner. There wasn't much trimming to do around the top, really I was just refining these two planes, making the edges sharper, and again just ensuring everything was nice and neat. And at last I just tidied up the area where the spinner had been pressing, and that's it for the clay work. I'll now let this pot dry out really slowly until it's bone dry, and then I'll bisque fire it in my electric kiln to 1000 degrees celsius, whereupon it will be waxed, glazed, and then packed into my gas kiln for a second firing to a much hotter temperature. But this entire process takes a few days, and once loaded into this kiln it's fired overnight and then unpack a few days later, all the pots now much harder and slightly porous too, like a sponge. And when this electric kiln's not in use, I push it right into the corner of the studio. Freeing up space for all the postage and packaging I'll soon be doing. And of course, a good mop is in order at this point. <laughs> 
The next step is the waxing of their feet. A relatively simple process, whereupon some wax emulsion is brushed over any portion of the pot which I want to remain unglazed, and it more or less just acts like any other wax resist, and during the next stage it'll prevent the glaze from adhering to this area of the pot. And this does save me some time, as it means there's less tidying up to do after the bowl has been glazed and allowed to dry out for a bit. And I just make sure I dab a bit of extra wax onto where I've stamped my maker's mark, as if that little detail is flooded with glaze, it can be quite difficult to clean out. The next step is the glazing, which is a fairly simple and quick process. I begin by grasping the pot with a pair of tongs, focusing my pressure somewhere on the walls where it doesn't feel too thin, nor do I want to grab it right by the rim. As with both of those cases, there is a chance when you heave the bowl out, if you don't properly let the internal glaze drain out, the bowl could crack under the weight, especially if you're clasping it incorrectly. I then set the freshly glazed piece aside, and as its surface will remain quite tacky and wet for a while, I won't actually touch these pots again until they've thoroughly dried out, as the surface is just so easy to damage at this point and I put the pots immediately onto a wearboard, which means that once they've all been glazed, I can just move the wearboard out of the way and begin glazing my next batch of work. And if you look below the bowls I've just glazed, you'll see that most of the glaze has flowed off the section I waxed, although not entirely. And the following day, once the surfaces of these pots have really dried out, I'll clean up each pot and use a wetted sponge to really tidy up the foot itself. But at this stage, all I'm trying to do is glaze them so the surface both inside and out is as even as possible and in such a way that some glaze pulled into that groove I trimmed in the top. And here are the same bowls the following day. Only now, all that water that was absorbed into the porous clay body has evaporated, leaving a surface that's far more powdery and easier to tidy up. Although it's really worth bearing in mind that if the glazes you're using contain more clay, they'll probably be more stubborn, whereas with this particular glaze, I can simply rub the tips of my fingers over any thick points to gradually wear them down, such as the marks left by the tongs. The glaze grinds away as I rub it, and it fills the holes left. I'm lucky, as with these quite molten crackle glazes, the tong marks do just completely disappear, whereas some other glaze recipes will show them no matter what, which means you need to find a different way of glazing your work it doesn't necessarily rely on using tongs. All I'm doing is looking for any high points in the glaze, drips, or any other kind of irregularity, and I tend to just use the blade of a paring knife to fettle them down and make them flush with the rest of the surface. After that, I switch to using a soaked sponge to clean up around the foot, removing any excess glaze that settles on the wax I applied earlier. The glaze can quickly saturate the sponge, so I wash it out often, which also immediately dilutes much of the dust. All the glaze that's removed, I collect, and eventually, I can recycle what's in this basin back into my much larger buckets of glaze the pots were initially dipped into. Occasionally I'll find small dots of bare clay, like this, from a bubble of trapped air when the pot was dipped. So to remedy this, I just dip some more glaze into that spot and give it a quick blast with a heat gun. Then I just continue as normal. And I will eventually just rub over that additional spot I added. And now finally the pots are glazed and tidied up so they're ready to be packed into my Rhoda KG 340 gas kiln, which instead of opening from the top, like my electric kiln, opens from the front, like a giant fridge. I'll then spend a few hours packing it, squeezing in as many pots as I physically can to make each firing as cost effective as possible. And as this is a gas kiln, I'm going to be reduction firing it, which means altering the internal atmosphere so that the fuel, which is gas, burns inefficiently as there's simply not enough oxygen inside the kiln during that stage of the firing 
and the tighter it's packed, the less space there is for oxygen to simply exist, which makes achieving a good reduction easier. Early the following morning, I'll ignite each of the four burners with the door swung open. This way gas can't accumulate inside the chamber and then be suddenly ignited, which, like you might guess, can cause explosions to occur. But once all four are lit, the door is tightly sealed and the temperature is gradually increased until approximately 1290 degrees Celsius, which is about 2354 degrees Fahrenheit. As I fire, I continually take notes, jotting down the temperature, the gas pressure, what time it is, the air pressure, and the damper position. The dampers are what we call the long shelf that covers these holes at the back. These holes are the flues in the kiln, and they lead up to the chimney above it. And the more I cover them with that kiln shelf, the stronger the reduction will be. And ultimately, it's this reduction which gives me the colours I'm after. If instead, I took these same glazed pots and fired them in my electric kiln to the same temperature, they would look entirely different, and not particularly nice either. It's a long process, taking about 9 hours from start to finish, the studio progressively getting hotter and hotter as the day goes on, but there comes a point where the gas can be turned off which is always a lovely moment, as the sound of rushing gas and turbulent flames finally comes to an end. About 36 hours later, the kiln has now cooled down enough so that it can be unpacked. This is always an exciting moment, as whilst I know roughly what's going on inside during the firing, I can never actually see it, and it's only after this point after so much could have potentially gone wrong, that you get to see the results. So I'm excited, yes, but I'm probably more nervous than anything. I begin by taking the pyrometric cones and setting them aside with all the others I've collected. Then the kiln itself can be unpacked, pot by pot, each piece inspected. And here's one of the bowls, now completely coated in green glass, an interesting rim and a very neat foot. It worked, I think. The form feels quite enclosed as compared to my usual bowls, and the indented top certainly makes that part of the pot really stand out. Although it almost feels as if the bowl should have a lid, as if something should sit over it. But despite that, I like how the glaze is pulled into that groove, and how the edges have broken into a slightly metallic brown colour. And the foot is just as neat too. All the glaze clean back to that facet I carefully trimmed. So, we'll see. Maybe I'll repeat this idea. The next step is to sand their feet. And to do this, I simply fill a tray with some water and use some kiln props to hold down some pieces of very fine wet and dry sandpaper. I then put the pots onto it and then just rotate it in place. I don't want to make the basis of these completely glassy smooth, as doing so would remove the color left on the surface from the reduction firing, which I feel removes some inherent quality it has. I think as an idea, it might work on a larger scale on larger pots, say large serving dishes or fruit bowls. But one quality I really like is how the slightly overhanging rim casts a shadow over the inside form. And then there's this bowl which was fired on a much higher shelf in the kiln, and the edges of the rim and the ledge beneath it went really quite dark and metallic, and I much prefer this one. Anyway, that's the end of the line. Let me know what you think, and thank you, as always, for taking the time to watch. And I'll see you next week.